The African Risk Capacity, ARC, is a specialised agency of the African Union. It was established with the goal of providing member states with the financial tools and infrastructure to improve their capacities to better plan, prepare and respond to extreme weather events and natural disasters by providing targeted responses in a timely, cost-effective, objective and transparent manner. Our vision is to be the development partner of preference and of reference for innovative Pan-African disaster risk management solutions for climate resilience in Africa. ARC aims to provide cost-effective contingency funding to protect livelihoods and development gains and uses modern finance mechanisms such as risk pooling and risk transfer to create Pan-African climate response systems. Smart premium financing support and funding are critical in building a regional culture of parametric insurance and anticipatory disaster risk management. Since 2014, 62 policies have been signed by member states for culminative insurance coverage of 720 million US dollars for the protection of 72 million vulnerable populations in participating countries. ARC has proved to be highly relevant to building Africa climate resilience. It supports the most vulnerable and is often women and children who suffer disproportionately from disasters, be it health or climate related ones. Women are indeed critical in risk mitigation and adaption. Mainstreaming gender in disaster risk management policies and actions is therefore critical in strengthening the resilience of these vulnerable groups. As part of its principles of engagement, at ARC, we adopt a differentiated approach to issues of gender equality and women empowerment. The commitment to closing the gender gap is central to achieving aspiration of both the SDGs in 2030 and the African Union's agenda in 2063. We are supporting the AU member states in delivering continental priorities and development agenda of building climate resilience and reducing vulnerability. Our African solution contributes directly to the aspirations outlined in the 2063 Agenda. Our organisation has also at its heart the achievement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, supported by our own comprehensive inclusive growth strategy. Not only that, we are helping our member states to mitigate and adapt not only to climate change risks, but now to pandemics and health outbreaks. Through our innovative solutions, we are making an impact where it matters most, and our job is to be on the front line of any disaster outbreak, supporting the most vulnerable and acting in a timely fashion in the eye of the storm. ARC, through ARC Agency and ARC Limited, brings a solution-oriented approach in assisting our members with the innovative tools, capacity building and financial resources they need for anticipatory responses to natural disaster risks. Our model is built on strengthening partnerships and providing the support to our partners to effectively respond to the unpredictable nature of climate change and other disaster outbreaks. Smart partnerships for holistic climate action will strengthen Africa's climate action and sustainable livelihoods towards protecting lives and livelihoods of vulnerable communities. African Risk Capacity – Transforming Disaster Risk Management and Financing in Africa Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning if you're in the east coast of the US. Welcome to the second Africa Risk Capacity Lecture Series. My name is Omar Ben Yedda. I'm the publisher of African Business. We're partnering with the African Risk Capacity who are convening this lecture. The first lecture that we held in June was a fascinating presentation by Mami Mizotori on disaster risk management, highlighting in concrete terms how proper planning and investment can help reduce the impact of climate change and extreme weather events, and the need to shift from post-event management to more robust disaster risk management and prevention. So from prevention rather than responsiveness. But 
Today, the theme of the second lecture will be a little bit broader in light of the upcoming COP27 gathering in Egypt in November. It will also take a slightly different format. We will have a keynote address from Her Excellency Commissioner Joseba Fako, who I know personally from her portfolio heading the Department for Rural Economy and Agriculture at the African Union. But uh, she's also very heavily involved on in climate change issues. And prior, prior to her election at the AU, she served as an ambassador responsible for climate change and was a special advisor to the Minister of the Environment, amongst many other responsibilities. Following this keynote statement, we will move on to a conversation chaired by the convener of this lecture, Mr. Ibrahim Sheikh Diong, United Nations Assistant Secretary General and Director General of the Africa Risk Capacity, the leading agency in Africa looking at climate-related disaster risk management, especially in terms of the rural and the most vulnerable communities. We are privileged to have two outstanding speakers today. The first is Dr. Mahmoud Mahaldeen, whose career I have been following since 2009, when he was Minister for Investment in Egypt. He then had a distinguished career at the World Bank, and today he has been nominated by Antonio Guterres as a UN climate change high-level champion, as well as a special envoy for financing Agenda 2030. We also have Dr. Kariuki, Vice President of the, at the African Development Bank. Dr. Kariuki, I, do, I can't say I've been following your career as long as that of Dr. Mohil Deans, but what I, what I can say is that you possibly hold the most important portfolio within the AFDB, one that is critical in delivering across all high five of the bank. You are Vice President of Power, Energy, Climate and Green Growth. No industrialization will happen without energy. No just society will happen unless we can protect our people from the devastating effects of climate change. And climate change is today in Africa leading to a number of emergencies on the continent. Health emergencies, security emergencies, migration, rural, uh, rural issues, loss of, uh, loss of crops in terms of agriculture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Our speakers are thinkers and intellectuals who have dissected the issues at hand to put together realistic and well thought through ideas. They also have experience on the ground of tackling complex international negotiations. We all understand climate change. However, the solutions are complex. They are multilateral. They are global. Our invited guests are also experienced financiers. And really the issue of finance for me is extremely important. And hopefully we'll broach, we'll broach it today. I look forward to, our, to understanding more about Africa's priorities turning global financial commitments into greener projects on the ground, what a fair energy transition looks like, and much more in a challenging global context. With COP27 around the corner, what is our Africa position? What is our Africa strategy? And what can we expect? A few questions to get us all thinking. Climate change is something that we all understand, as I said, but it's highly complex and tackling it with all these different competing priorities and immediate emergencies is not as straightforward as we think. We want questions from the audience, and this is something that uh, Mr. Ibrahim Sheikh Jong has been uh, very specific about. He wants this to be a conversation, and he wants us, the whole community needs to be engaged in issues of climate change. So please, we'll have at least 20 minutes allocated at the end. So submit your questions on the chat, which we will monitor. Be active. There are no bad questions, just poor answers. Lastly, I'd like to thank the African Risk Capacity, our hosts. You can find out more about their work at www.arc.int, and also our partners, the African Development Bank, the African Union, our speakers, of course, and a special shout out to the Egyptian Center for Economic Studies, ESSIS, a think tank that has been very supportive on this lecture and is doing some great work, not only on climate change, but also on business and economic issues on Egypt and obviously Africa and Africa's development. Without further ado, let me introduce to you the Director General of the African Risk Capacity, Mr. Ibrahima Sheikh Diong. The floor is yours. Well, Omar, thank you very much as always for that uh, very warm and wonderful introduction, not only of our speakers, but also of the lecture series in uh, setting the scene beautifully well. A very good morning uh, or good afternoon, wherever you're watching and listen to us. It is very important uh, uh, gathering. We appreciate your time and dedication to the exercise we're about to engage with. 
Uh, also, a very warm welcome to another lecture series for the African Mirrors uh, capacity. This is an important gathering uh, for us because this is an opportunity for us to engage with the rest of the world in the work that we do through the African uh, Disaster Resilience uh, Forum Lecture. It's only organized by us. But we at ARC strongly believe in partnership, and that's why we're delighted to have the African Union joining us as a partner to this event. The African Union's voice is always extremely important. So we're delighted the African Union is here to lead as we formulate the African voice for this exercise. We're also delighted to have the African Development Bank. When we talk about a bank, talk about financing, but the bank also play a major role in mobilizing the resources required to support the African funding needs for climate change adaptation. So we're delighted to have Dr. Karaoke with us. And as Omar said earlier, the Egyptian Center for Academic Studies plays a major role in this conversation. And my good uh, sister, Dr. Abla, is very um, passionate about putting together the African think tank so they can play a major role at COP27. And she's been quite energized in pushing that narrative so that they're not, not left behind. And last but not least, the African uh, Business Magazine uh, is going to help us using their platform and making sure the African narrative and story is heard loud and clear. Uh, we're delighted to actually have the, the right partners on the table. So what I will call the right partners at the right event. And this is really what really the African voice is all about. Let me speak on behalf of all the partners and ourselves to say how, how honored we are and privileged that uh, we are actually having this gathering today. Uh, the importance is fundamental to African development, but also to making sure we join our forces and energy in protecting the life and livelihood of many Africans across the continent who are affected by climate change, but also other perils as well. Now, it is, I am sure we can all agree that one of the biggest challenges today that we face as a world happened to be climate change. And if you don't believe me, you have to just watch what's happening both in Africa, outside of Africa, when it comes to flooding. And we're beginning to understand the importance of early warning system of anticipation so that these disasters don't actually take the life of many vulnerable communities in Africa in particular. And that is why this conversation is extremely important. It is also important as we head to COP27, and we're not too far from that event. It's about four months from now, even less than now. What I hear quite often in the conversation that I participate, that the African voice has to be structured, coordinated, convey in a way we can be powerful in uh, at uh, COP27. And that's why the speakers we have today, we could not think of better speakers to be able to at least carry the African voice as we move forward. So therefore, it is our obligation for us to make sure the African needs, the African concerns, the African expectation are conveyed in a much coordinated way so that we don't actually go to COP27 and find ourselves, our voice is not heard by the rest of the world. And I have no doubt with the champions that we have on this call, but also the other African institutions, we will achieve that, that objective. Uh, I know so much progress has been made uh, from Paris to Glasgow. What I hear quite often from many conversations is whether or not the commitment has been made at this uh, COP uh, kept, particularly when it comes to financial commitment uh, for Africa, but also for the rest of the world as well. So I think it'd be good to just ask our speakers today, where do we stand today on this commitment to make sure we don't actually go to another COP with the same outcome whereby these expectations uh, are not met. And that is why I am delighted that you, to set the scene of our conversation, uh, we will be listening to a message from Her Excellency Ambassador Josefa Leonel Sacco, who is the Commissioner for Rural Economy and Agriculture at the African Union. It is absolutely important to start from there because the voice of the African Union hopefully will carry the voice of Africa at COP27. And as I say, following that conversation, that uh, uh, 
scene setting by ambassador, we'll then have a conversation with our two speakers. But so without further ado, I'd like to then invite our production team to share with you the message that we got from Her Excellency Ambassador Sarko. And I'll come back for the conversation. So over to you, production. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol duly observe. I bring you greetings from the African Union Commission, and I am honored to be a part of this lecture series on Africans' route to COP27 and the opportunity to engage on matters that are pertinent to our continent. I know I speak for many when I say that I am excited that Africa will be hosting COP27. The third time the event will be held in Africa and as we head to Egypt in November 2022. We have to be deliberate on our approach and ensure that any engagement that will emanate from this define, defining global event will be representative of the interests and needs of our continent. This lecture will certainly be uh, foundational in uh, spotlighting the important issue of global warming and its impact on Africa. And uh, importantly, it is a platform to help us deliberate on possible outcome we seek as part of our preparation for the 27th conference of the party. A big thank you to ARC for hosting this session. Africa is on the front line of the uh, climate uh, emergency, of the climate e emergency. The IPCC 2022 Six assessment uh, report highlights Africa exposure to the impact of climate shocks. The increase in uh, intensity and occurrence of weather induced uh, disaster is a reality for Africa, often leaving a trail of uh, destruction that our economy cannot shoulder. It is important that we speak in one accord and make our voice heard. Has the host continent, COP27, will be a significant platform for us, and we must make it account. Coming from the African Union, agricultural, rural development, blue economy, and sustainable environment, our interests are very much aligned with ARC's mandate. I know we share a common interest to see how COP27 will augment our work and look forward to the outco outcome of COP27. ARC's mandate to strengthen African Union member states' capacity to plan, prepare, and respond to natural disaster threats speaks to the very core of our operation and complements our effort to ultimately improve food security on the continent. The upcoming COP27 is a tremendous opportunity to speak with one voice as a continent and shape the direction of response to global warming. It is a known fact that although Africa contributes the least to global warming, bearing about 40% of global greenhouse gases, we are one of the most impacted for, some, for a number of reasons. One, our capacity to ad adapt to such threats is, sev is severely impacted by limited re resources. And two, our economy are heavily dependent on rain-fed agriculture and therefore are the, at the mercy of the weather. Between now and November, leading up to, to the COP, our job is to intensify our effort to advocate for Africa's position among stakeholders. By the time we get to Egypt, Africa's position must be clear. We have much work to do together to make it happen, and several efforts are currently ongoing. This summit must yield value rather than just talk. 
we must be able to connect to outcomes from the previous session and translate this uh, into action from all players. This requires that we understand our story and be able to articulate and argue our position well. COP27 will also present opportunities for Africa to build and strengthen relationships that will facilitate efforts to mitigate, build resilience and adapt to climate change. The job before us is massive and requires a collaborative effort. We are pleased that Egypt is advocating for an implementation COP, an action COP. We look forward to concrete action him at implementing the Paris Agreement. This is time for us to implement the Paris Agreement because that was in COP15. We are in COP27 and we haven't started implementing it. So we need to really uh, uh, take uh, uh, stock of this uh, and the opportunity and benefit of this COP22 to raise, to, to raise or mobilize resources to start implementing because the the situation, the weather situation in Africa is not very good. Beyond COP27, we must keep the momentum by translating this mission into tangible benefits for our communities. As one of the most affected by the climate crisis, Africa has to lead by taking ownership of its obligations. We owe it to our people to ensure that through policy and implementation, we are aligned with this global initiative and through enforcement, we can be an example of what we, we demand. In all of these actions, the importance of partnership cannot be overstressed. We must have a common vision, work together and learn from each other and together we can make our road to COP27 an impactful one, even beyond just this event. I thank you for your kind attention. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador Josefa Leonel Sacco, for that very strong push for the African voice at COP27. We also use this opportunity to thank the African Union for the leadership in making sure that the African voice is actually heard at COP27. Let me now jump right into the conversation with our two doctors. And gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ibrahim. Excellent. Excellent. It takes a while to unmute. Yeah, uh, great. Uh, Thank you. Assalamu alaikum and, uh, and bonjour. So Dr. Right. Mahmoud, let me just start with you. Uh, I know over the past a couple of months, I've watched you interact with so many key stakeholders around the world by COP27. And I always see how you push the African narrative. So if you could just share with us from your actually perspective, when you look at Africa and the challenges that we face on climate change, what would you say are some of the major challenges that the continent is faced right now when it comes to climate change? Right. Um, thank you so much. And um, I listened carefully to uh, your introductory remarks and uh, the um, intervention uh, by the commissioner. And um, let me uh, very quickly uh, share with you, perhaps from the four main items on the agenda, on the state actors, I represent, as you know, the non-state actors as coordinators, and as uh, this is the name, um, uh, the, or the title, uh, champion for COP27. Um, so, the four files are mitigation, adaptation, finance, and the loss and damage. Just to organize our thoughts. In the four areas, there are major um, issues of concern when it comes to uh, Africa. Bearing in mind at the beginning, as mentioned by the commissioner, that if you find the responsibility of the African continent for the emissions, you'll not find much. Three percent for the whole continent in the harmful emissions. This is um, compared to some of the members of the G20 countries. You get one country five times that figure, that's one. And the other one is like 10, 10 times if you consider US and China, for instance. 
So in terms of the responsibility of the whole continent for the emissions, you don't really see this um, the responsibility. But when it comes to impact disproportionately, you'll find that the countries of the African continent are suffering. And this kind of suffering you can really see in all of the areas required to have attention, either on the adaptation front or in the loss and damage front. The, um, the high exposure of the coastal areas and cities, the kind of investments required for infrastructure to make it more resilient, the damage that is happening to the agricultural sector, the vulnerability of the energy sector that is relying on, the, um, on the hydro um, as a source of generation of electricity. So in terms of the exposure and harm, the continent is harmed significantly. And um, you go into the mitigation pile, okay? There are many opportunities. It's great to see that many of the African continents are in the top of the atlas of uh, wind, of uh, solar, and there are some serious uh, investments in, um, in that front. I'm uh, speaking to you today from Egypt, which is now a host of one of the biggest solar farms in the world, one of the top four. Um, Morocco is not far from us, and you can really see other examples around the continent. Wind farms, huge opportunities for investments as well. Green hydrogen, I'm happy to see that six African countries are not just engaged in MEUs and uh, um, preliminary talks, but they are putting the principles for green, clean hydrogen as well. So the mitigation front and access to energy, there is some effort, but a very well-known figure, and I'll be very brief here, 800 million people around the world are suffering from lack of access to electricity. Three out of four happen to be African. Then, and you talk vertically on the loss and damage I just mentioned there. Unfortunately, we need to, really to see some sort of serious attention to this file. And then the final part, which I may come back to at the end, um, or the end, is basically on the finance that is to be desired. The 100 billion that is not delivered, the investment that are lacking, the technology that's not really supportive, the accumulation of debt, um, uh, uh, encouragement of some of the financial institutions to borrow more in order to deal with the climate uh, challenges, um, opportunities and challenges in establishing carbon markets, issues related to debt reduction mechanisms. So these are just some subtitles right. that I'll come back to when you are Absolutely. giving the Absolutely. Dr. Mahmoud, we'll certainly come back to commitment, financing, opportunities, and so on that you mentioned. But let's just try to understand uh, the, the nature of the problem we're trying to address. We'll come back to some of the solutions. And Dr. Karaoke, building on what Mahmoud has said, and that is that Africa is very much concerned about linking responsibility and impact, but also the fact that for Africa, loss and damages is extremely important because that's how we protect our vulnerable communities. Let me also turn over to you, the same question. I know you interact with so many African governments and you hear a lot of stories about the African concerns. So walk us through from what you heard so far, looking at climate change and the African continent, where do you see some of the major challenges that we need to address as a continent? And I believe you're on mute, Dr. Kavio. Uh, thank you very much. I think the way I will uh, try to address the question um, or to respond to the question, uh, having heard what I had, is um, uh, from the perspective of why, you know, Africa should be prioritizing climate change. And the, here, there are, I must say, there are a number of compelling reasons why this should be the case. To start with, I think um, uh, the Global Center on Adaptation uh, told us that Africa's climate change is already locked in for the next 20 years. And actually, as a matter of fact, it's today regarded as the highest risk uh, amplifier for economic development and fragility in most of our countries. Indeed, there are mounting evidences showing that Africa, as Dr. Maudin said, is the most vulnerable continent on the, uh, 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 to, to the adverse impacts of climate change. So what we know, we know that uh, from the latest uh, Climate Vulnerability Index, nine out of 10 of the world's most vulnerable countries are in Africa. 
These are Chad, Central Africa Republic, Eritrea, Guinea-Bissau, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan, Niger, Liberia, Somalia, all in Sub-Saharan Africa. So furthermore, um, you know, already, and this is what we hear, Africa already loses a staggering seven billion to fifteen billion dollars every year due to a devastating impacts of climate change. And IMF projects that this figure could go as high as fifty billion dollars per year by twenty thirty, a constituting about seven percent of Africa's GDP. What else do we know? We also know that agriculture is the most impacted of all the sectors, and it is projected that climate change will reduce yields of Africa's rain, rain fed staple crops but by 8 to 22% over the next 22 years. What does this mean? It means that it will be exacerbating the existing food security situation where already 246 million people uh, are go, go to bed hungry. I mean, and, and the reality is we know that in 2019, we had uh, cyclones Idai and Kenneth in Mozambique, Malawi, and Zimbabwe. This is still fresh in our minds. These cyclones affected about 3 million people. This is the real, this is reality. 50% of whom are children, causing as many as 1,000 deaths. And damaging infrastructure estimated about $2 billion. And it destroyed more than 1 million acres of cropland and then 100,000 homes. Yet, the region was also visited early this year by cyclones Anna and Idai, sorry, Anna and Batsirai, causing further damage, wanton damage, including critical infrastructure. I think it is for this reason uh, that I, I would say, and I'm not talking shop here, that the African Development Bank has recently adopted a very ambitious uh, strategic framework on climate change and green growth. This framework builds on recent progress in significantly increasing its levels of climate finance from 9% in 2016 to 41% in 2021, whilst growing the share of adaptation finance from that 6% to 67% last year. I'm proud to say that the bank was the first MDB to achieve that, to exceed parity. And this is in recognition, and that's why I'm saying we are listening, that adaptation and resilience building is Africa's greatest priority. Let me stop here for that particular question. So, Excellent. I think you both uh, set the scene beautifully well in the challenges that Africa has faced. And everything you said, obviously, is music to our ears at ARC, uh, loss and damages to protect vulnerable communities. You talked about uh, the important climate finance, but also energy transitions and all the other initiatives that the bank is involved with. Now, let's move on now to our next topic. And uh, we had Paris, we had Glasgow. COP26, there's so many gathering whereby the Africans came together and make sure in the negotiation, in the discussion, their voices are heard. Let me just turn over to Dr. Mahmoud again. If you look at COP26, just give us your tech as far as Africa is concerned in terms of what are some of the takeaways that actually contributed to at least making the African case or the African concerns being heard, knowing in particular the concern that you made about commitment not being met on the financing side. So before we get to COP26, COP27, sorry, focusing on COP26, what did we achieve at COP26 as far as Africa is concerned? You're mute, Dr. Mahmoud. Thank you. I, I think the negotiators did their best in order to defend the uh, individual country positions based on their commitments under the Paris Agreement and within the published priorities, uh, finance strategies for the uh, uh, climate or the NDCs as well. But for the whole continent, I would say that the main project that got some sort of attention is the uh, promise for the South African um, uh, project there, a very promising. I mean, if you hear the main issues, uh, phasing out from coal, investing in renewables, 
dealing with the implications through a just transition mechanism, uh, dealing with the impact of local communities. So all of these elements sound fantastic. The only thing that so far, it seemed that there, there is an issue of implementation and the commitment of 8.5 billion needed really, we are now more than six months since Glasgow and uh, the announcement then, which makes many people, including me, skeptical about announcements that are not really um, uh, tied uh, with strong strings to um, uh, timelines and accountability. I'm not criticizing anybody here. I'm just saying that we are I'm wishing the best of luck for the continuation. And I know that my uh, good friends and brothers in South Africa are doing their best in putting the project on track. And that is going to be a good example um, uh, for others to follow uh, because it has all of its elements in terms of blueprint uh, perspective. But I like to just say, you mentioned the 100 billion. And again, there is a great deal of dispute about the 100 billion. I know at, at the time um, it was mentioned that almost 79% of the figure had been um, uh, um, submitted. Um, there are many issues about the methodology, the double counting, the multiple counting. There are some credible organization, including Oxfam, saying that the figure exceed 20%. I know that uh, colleagues at uh, the African Development Bank tend to be updated uh, on this, are trying to do some effort in order to make an assessment of the deliverables and the impact of the 100 billion um, uh, or the part that uh, has something to do with Africa on that. But mind you, if even if the 100 billion is fully there with us, it's less than 5% of what's required for the developing economies and emerging markets right. economies to deal with the climate action. So we need to think here about what could be happening on the COP27, which I'll, I'll come back to. So this is basically what I, I can really summarize, that uh, COP26, uh, had managed to bring the momentum back. Uh, negotiators did their best. There is a project highlighted. There are some question marks about the flow of finance and investments where it matters. And technology, we don't need to undermine technical assistance and technology in the field of applying. All right, Dr. Mahmoud, uh, I like to push my speakers every now and then. Let me push you a little bit. I think particularly on the hundred million uh, billion dollars commitment. I know we have the whole world watching and listening to us, and I know, I know you're in the know. Uh, uh, judging from what happened in the Paris commitment, do you think from now until COP27 we have at least the higher probability for that hundred billion actually to be met, so that Africa can at least be hopeful we can get some resources for adaptation? Over to you. Are you asking me or asking uh, no, Dr. Dr. Mahmoud first? I'm going to push you a little bit just to share with us what you know in the 100 billion. Are you optimistic or pessimistic that we can actually meet those commitments by uh, COP27 or is it just talk at this at this step level? No, I, I would say for this year, I think it's going to be more of the same. Uh, there will be some updates on uh, Some people are still speculating that the figure could be uh, uh, a bit higher than last year or close to last year. But uh, my argument here that the 100 billion, even if it is submitted and committed and delivered fully, this is less than 5% of, uh, of what's uh, required. This is putting the methodology um, aside. And that's why COP26, along with COP27, had the commission, our good sister, Vera Songwi, with Professor Nick Stern, to have um, a policy paper on assessing finance for climate and development, including an assessment of what had been delivered so far and what are the gaps of finance. And this should be shared a few weeks before um, uh, Sharm Sheikh. Excellent. Well, I know 100 billion does not meet the whole needs, but at least that's a good start uh, so that we can actually see where the gaps are. And then, Dr. Karyoki, let me turn over to you. <laughs> Let me turn over to Dr. Karaoke, and I know the bank is heavily involved in making sure we actually mobilize additional resources to meet on adaptation, but also the bank is very much involved in energy transition. So over to you, walk us through what the bank has done since COP26, particularly on adaptation, 
but also your tech on the energy transition and the role you intend to play as a bank. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think you, you, you really hit the nail on the head. Um, uh, as I indicated earlier, uh, the bank prides itself uh, in understanding the needs of Africans uh, with regard to adaptation. And here, I would want to refer to the period in the lead up to COP26 and after. In the lead up to COP26, in actual, in actual fact, early last year, we established what is called the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program. And the essence of this particular program is to try and double climate finance on the continent, uh, you know, uh, in the soonest time, you know, as soon as we possibly could. Because we appreciate that unless we are able to provide sufficient resources for adaptation, then the, 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 the bulk of the continent will remain, uh, I mean, and, and, and this is because Africa is also the least adaptive uh, of, of all the continents. Unless we provide sufficient resources for adaptation, then we will be doing a zero sum game. Africa will continue facing uh, all these extreme weather events, suffering from the extreme weather events, and, you know, periodically, right, you know, one after the other. And, and so uh, that is the one area whereby we are trying to address, you know, come up with um, resilient infrastructure. These are things that we are working upon. We are working on um, uh, uh, smart agriculture and also, you know, you know trying to, um, you know, facilitate um, uh, what we call um, uh, sort of predictive uh, you know, data-based uh, predictive systems so that we are able at the end of the day to, to predict some of these uh, weather events. And of course, you are aware, uh, Ibrahima, that uh, we work very closely with yourselves uh, and our Griffey and ARC uh, with a view to mitigating some of, um, uh, of the impacts that uh, result from uh, uh, cli uh, climate change. So this is, these are some of the things that we are doing. We, we have continued doing that. Uh, and in actual fact, we have enhanced ambition as far as that is concerned. Uh, you know, just before uh, COP26, uh, we also approved a new uh, climate change and green growth policy, uh, which we aim uh, to, with, from which we aim to uh, basically triple uh, the, uh, the, the access to climate finance in Africa. To date, I think uh, you would be aware that Africa only accounts for 3% of the global climate finance. So under the new uh, uh, framework, we are hoping to increase uh, Africa's access to climate finance up to uh, 10%. So over, over the life of, um, of, of that particular uh, 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 climate change and green growth uh, strategy. That's number one. Number two, Considering the, the, the challenges that we are having in, in, in um, mobilizing climate finance, we have actually gone out of our way as a bank to try and create as part of what we call the, the ADF 16, our, our, our transitional window, to create a specific climate action window with a view to mobilizing 13 billion dollars over a three year period to actually just address the issues of climate change on the continent. And you'll be pleased to note that of that component, 63% uh, will be earmarked for adaptation because we acknowledge that adaptation is, is basically where we need to go. So that's number one. And number two, uh, uh, to, to respond to the issue of um, uh, the South African just energy transition, you know, we acknowledge that South Africa is actually um, big, you know, and, and as, as uh, Dr. Mudin uh, mentioned, this is one area that you can say was a, a huge plus for, 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 for Africa in the sense that it was recognized by virtue of how progressive and ambitious Looks like we, we lost Dr. Karaoke. Um, yes. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, we are supporting South Africa with a view to trying to see how they can actually be able to actualize uh, this particular program. 
uh, in, in South Africa because we know once uh, the, the, we address the South African just energy transition, we will also be addressing by uh, because of the connection uh, the the. Uh, the South African uh, South African development community, because the South African region is fairly interconnected from a power point of view. Uh, I think that's what I would want to say as far well as uh, question is concerned. Thank you very much, Dr. Kayak. I don't know about those who are watching and listening. This is a fascinating conversation, uh, learning a lot where Africa stands as far as COP is concerned. I encourage all of you actually to go to our chat room and start preparing your questions. We'll try to answer as much as we can, and those that we can answer today, hopefully we'll be able to provide you answers uh, in the future. Now, gentlemen, we've talked about now the situation of Africa. We talked about COP26. Let's move forward to COP27. And I am reminded every single day, we're less than four months away from November. So the clock is ticking. We don't have a lot of time. So my question to you, Dr. Mahmoud, if you look at the COP27, and the three things I wanted to address, number one, the African voice. Do you think today is coordinated enough and to be heard at COP27 in a way that, in a mind that we want? Or maybe there are many African voices, maybe you should address that. And then second, if you could just address what are some of the priorities that you see for Africa at COP27? Are we talking about the same priorities at COP26, loss and damages? Uh, commitment, maybe we're good to walk us through the priorities. And last but not least, what are the opportunities for the continent? So that we don't actually go to COP27, have no one else to blame but ourselves, because we're not well organized and we're not putting forward our points. So over to you, Dr. Mahmoud. I'll come to you, Dr. Kelly. Right. Um, well, um, I'm happy to tell you the following. And uh, actually, our meeting today is coming between two major African meetings. At the beginning of August, we had three-day discussion um, um, hosted by the Region Economic Commission, the presidency of COP27, and the climate champions. This is unprecedented initiative to bring the regional perspective, um, not just with Africa. We actually, in a few days, I'll be in Asia and Thailand to do the same with SCAP, and then we'll be in Santiago for uh, ECLAC, and then with ESPO, and then with ECE in, in Europe. So this regional perspective was highlighted in three days. The, negotiate, the African negotiators participated in many of the sessions, and in through six sessions, actually the, the same one that we discussed, uh, energy transition, food, uh, water management, uh, digitalization and, and technology, uh, carbon markets, uh, finance, and the blue, uh, blue economy, these were the six sessions. Uh, actually, the African priorities were highlighted, or I would say had been re-emphasized. In a uh, in few days, we'll be in Gabon uh, for the Climate Finance Week in Africa. And again, and I see the agenda in front of me now, the same issues are being reiterated. And it's, it's great that we see the same points coming back strongly, not just with complaints, they are coming with solutions. And this is basically what I see of a kind of an interesting 2080, a kind of an approach that you spend 20% of the time highlighting the problem, but you spend four times as much trying to explain how to fix it. So for the COP27, I would say that all of these issues that we discussed, in addition to a very important aspect, which is basically about the projects, we just spoke about the potential of the South African project that gave many people hope and good expectations. But um, in that meeting in, uh, in, in Addis a few days ago, we highlighted 140 projects with potential. And through the collaboration of the facilitators, they have been shortlisted to 19. And now we're working with three investment banks with the leadership of the Regional Economic Commission of Africa in association with African Union, African Development Bank with their IFC and others. That there are three investment banks are going to be adding to the list of the projects related to mitigation. I'm saying mitigation because adaptation is still a challenge to the business sector. So do you consider that the public sector, either domestic public sector or through international finance means that could be really providing a solution. So very quickly, in Sharm, we'd be expecting the following, a holistic approach to dealing with the climate action, not to have this kind of reductionist approach to climate. Because while you are doing climate, you need to make sure that any kind of solution will not 
make us more vulnerable when it comes to poverty or health or education or inequality or jobs. So this is a holistic approach. And where is the solution? Is basically climate uh, action is SDG in action at the same time. So sustainable development goals have to be put there. Second part is basically about implementation, implementation. Projectize everything that makes sense. Third, the regional approach that I just mentioned. Fourth, localize. And our uh, folks and friends at the African um, 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 uh, Finance Corporation um, had highlighted the solutions coming from localization, enhancing the value added. And then finally, it's finance. Revisiting your 100 billion through that approach about the post 2025. Then focusing more on investment, debt reduction mechanism, relying less on debt. It is unfair for a continent that didn't really cause the damage to ask the members of this continent to go and borrow to fix what the rest of the world had, or many countries in that rest of the world, especially in the advanced economies since the first industrial revolution were responsible for. And then innovation. Innovation comes through carbon market mechanism that should be tailored to the needs and standards of Africa, not to take it as a, a copy and paste. And then we need really to enhance innovation through ESG investments and making the budgets of the state fully aligned with the priorities. So well, Mr. a very rich agenda, as you can see. Absolutely, a very rich agenda. And I'm very confident to hear you say, it's not gonna be business as usual at COP27. And more importantly, we're not just thinking about solution, we're also thinking about, uh, we're not thinking about just the problem, sorry. We also think about the solution as well. So I'm sure uh, with your leadership, we'll make sure those points actually are covered at COP27. I'm particularly comforted by the fact that there is a regional coordination that are taking place across the continent to make sure that African voice is heard loud and clear. Dr. Karaoke, over to you. Dr. Karaoke, I know at the bank, you are, are busy as well, working with your partners. I know, for example, the Global Center for Adaptation is working with you to make sure that the African voice is also heard and adaptation. What are some of the uh, priorities and opportunities that you see as we head to COP27? Well, thank you very much, Ibrahim. Um, uh, I think uh, that in the lead up uh, to COP27, uh, there needs to be an urgent action to build on the momentum generated at COP26. So the African COP, as you call it, in Egypt, is therefore an important uh, opportunity for the world and Africa to continue effort to expedite the implementation uh, of, of the Paris Agreement by providing access to the means of implementation. What do I mean? Essentially, what this, this is what uh, Dr. Mahmoud has just said, essentially it means translating commitments into tangible action regarding resource mobilization, capacity building, enabling the environment, and technology transfer. And therefore, for us as, as a bank, we are looking to make it to, to, to participating in a process that makes Shamel Sheikh to be forever remembered as a watershed moment for global climate action. But to be precise, from an African perspective, COP27 offers a veritable opportunity to reinforce the message that Africa needs urgent action to build resilience to climate change, including actions related to adaptation finance, technology transfer for renewable energy, nature-based solutions, as well as loss and damage. COP27 also presents a very good chance for the host country, Egypt, and the bank to demonstrate leadership in climate action while advocating for Africa's special circumstances on climate change, including the criticality of adaptation and loss of damage for Africa and the need for robust action from the global community. Specifically, to be more specific, Africa, we expect that developed nations will actualize their commitments regarding climate finance, including adaptation finance, as these resources constitute important components of the conditional commitments without which efforts pegged on voluntary national determined contribution of African countries will be in vain as far as um, Africa's contribution to the Paris Agreement is concerned. Hence, in the spirit of common purpose and shared destiny, Africa expects 
that the Paris Agreement commitments related to $100 billion are climate finance for developing nations and the plan to double adaptation by, by 2025 will actually be fulfilled. In this regard, to foster the related dialogue at COP27, the African Development Bank, along with other African institutions, will be hosting the African Pavilion to showcase climate action in Africa and provide a platform for exchanging views among stakeholders, including the bank and African countries, on measures for accelerating climate, climate action on the continent. Excellent. Well, look, I hope we can uh, get the videos of your messages just uh, shown all over COP27 so you can be heard loud and clear because you make the African voice, the African gaze, uh, strongly and very well articulated. And I'm hoping that since the COP27 will be happening in Sharm el Sheikh, maybe the word Sheikh will actually inspire the rest of the delegation to check the world so we can get the climate change that uh, we want. Now, let me just uh, wrap up my line of question and address the, the last point, and that is life doesn't stop at COP27. Uh, life will go on after COP27. And uh, so therefore the question is learning from the experience and the lesson of the past where black commitment were not met, where African boys were not articulate, where there's no momentum after, after the COP. So Dr. Mahmoud, over to you. What do you think we should do beyond COP27 to make sure these commitments are met but the Africa continues also to be better coordinated and articulated in a way that we can move to implementation, as you say. Right, I think uh, it's very much uh, uh, the case that in the design of the work of the presidency of COPS and the work of the climate champions through the UNFCCC and the Marrakesh partnership, it required the presidency to stay um, um, for a while after the summit in order to make sure that what had been promised is being put on, on delivery. Um, there have been lots of mandates uh, given to COP27 from COP26. I would expect the same from COP27 to COP28. It's going to be hosted in a fellow Arab country uh, that is very much uh, aware of the neighborhood challenges in Africa. I think um, uh, by the time we finish the preparation of COP27, this kind of regional perspective is going to be owned more not just by the Regional Economic Commission or the African Development Bank or the Asian Development Bank, because their mandate is typically regional, but basically integrating what's regional with the global, having better alignment between the sustainable development goals and the climate action, because we are confronting serious uh, challenges and crises in health, in, in finance, and in food plus energy. So this kind of continuation of getting the climate action not to address problems of the future as we should but in addition to that we are dealing with problems of permanent and immediate nature permanent because they have been with us for a while access to energy in africa issues related to food security matters related to indebtedness so the beautiful thing about the design of the cop 27 through this kind of engagement that we are putting some practical steps for solutions. It's all about follow up in what's going to be um, uh, uh, promised and to be delivered according to timelines, specific timelines. Excellent. Well, Dr. Karayaku, over to you. After COP27, I know the bank has a number of initiatives to keep the momentum going. So walk us through the bank's plan after COP27 to make sure we keep the momentum going. I think, um... You know, we, we fully understand that what we need to worry about um, is if, if we have to move the dial as far as climate uh, change uh, is concerned, is that we need uh, significant resources to do this. So the first thing I want to say is that, um, and uh, Dr. Mahmoud mentioned this, is that we are investing in knowledge building and one of these particular products is what we call the 2022 Africa Economic Outlook, which is actually based for the first time on amalgamation of African natural determined contributions. And this report showed that in actual fact, what Africa needs as far as adaptation or as far as climate finance is concerned 
is $128 billion per year, all the way up to 2030. So in my view, one of the things that will keep us busy post COP27 is to, is, is to try and um, introduce or make a, a, a conscious effort to pronounce that it, it is soon it, it is important that we start thinking about the post uh, 2025 climate finance target because so far everybody has been talking about the 100 billion dollars by 2025 doubling of um, uh, adaptation finance by 2025 so i think the, the, the most important thing is that the bank will ensure that we work closely with everybody else to ensure that there's a collective call, an enhanced collective call to raise ambition for transformative uh, uh, climate action throughout Africa. Uh, moving to the other side of, of the equation, which is uh, the, the, the energy side of it, you know, we know that, uh, as, as uh, Dr. Mahmoud said, Africa has only contributed marginally to greenhouse gas emissions. To be precise, less than 3% of historical um, anthropogenic uh, gas, greenhouse gas emissions. So it is a fact that there is need, uh, there is an emergency that needs to be resolved. However, we are also aware that 600 million people in Africa lack access to electricity, which is 80%, and I know Dr. Mungin said 70, 75%, you have to write exactly 80% of the global population of access to electricity. And another 1 billion, Africans lack access to clean cooking solutions and technologies. But we are also aware that we have fast growing population growth and ongoing economic transformation. Therefore, from my perspective, Africa must make a step change in investment activity uh, if we are to meet sustainable development goals. Therefore, what we actually need is to institute just energy transitions depending based on our huge and largely uncapped sources of renewable energy. Dr. Mahmoud also mentioned that in terms of solar, in actual fact, what we have, Africa has 40% of the, of the global solar potential. We have 350 gigawatts of hydro potential. All of these can be harnessed to underpin Africa's um, uh, uh, development on a, on a low carbon pathway. So at the African uh, Development Bank, I must say we are fully committed to seizing the renewable energy potential and scaling up energy access. And here I can say our investment portfolio is increasingly clean with more than 85% of our new generation since 2016 being based on renewables. This includes, I know what um, Dr. Mahmoud said, uh, there's uh, 510 megawatts new world disaster, which is the world's largest solar power plant, and the 310 megawatts Lake Trukana wind project in Kenya, which is the Africa's largest wind farm. So I think, in my view, it is a question of how we, we, you know, we, we, we look at the nexus between climate change on the one hand and the transition to clean energy on the other, because it is imperative that Africa is able to provide electricity uh, and address its energy poverty if Africa is to, is to attain its sustainable development goals. Thank you. Excellent. Well, look, as I said earlier, we could not think of a better advocate of the African voice and the African priorities and the African expectations. And I wish we can get these two tapes all over the world, so people can actually hear what Africa stands for, but also Africa's concern and expectations. So hopefully the decision makers around the world will hear what uh, two Africans have to say by the African uh, perspective. I am hoping that after COP27, maybe we'll get together again, have another lecture series, just to see whether some of those expectations are met and what we need to do kind of differently. I know we have plenty of questions in the chat room, and I am, can't wait to hand over to Omar to just take some of those questions before we wrap up the conversation. So Omar, over to you. Thank you, Ibrahima. I'll try and group the questions uh, per topic. I mean, one that comes uh, over and over again is the issue of finance. 
So I'll group uh, three questions in terms of the issue of finance, and maybe uh, the three of you can uh, can answer them uh, one way or another. The first one is, um, why is it that the $100 billion commitment or the $100 billion annual commitment aren't being, uh, isn't forthcoming when we've seen that they've been printing money and uh, issuing uh, $700 billion relief in the, in the EU, the, the Americans printing trillions of dollars of support uh, during COVID. $100 billion ultimately is a small amount in, uh, in global terms. So why isn't the money forthcoming? How should it be channeled and uh, with, through which mechanisms? Should it be channeled through the multilateral development banks, the governments directly, or institutions such as IFAD, WFP, or ARC? And uh, what are the mechanisms in place? I mean, we've seen certain initiatives at COP15, for example, the Africa Renewable, Renewable Energy Initiative, but ultimately, we're not tracking them nor monitoring them. So what can we do in terms of tracking and monitoring? And I think Dr. Mahmoud uh, Mahmoudin uh, mentioned this. So what can we do more or better to make sure that these commitments are met? So ultimately it's about why, why aren't the commitments being met? What can we, or how should we be channeling them through what agencies or through what instruments or through what mechanisms and how can we track them better? Maybe the three of you can uh, can comment on that, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Mahaldeen, then Dr. Karyuki, and then Ibrahima, who's also got ideas in terms of mechanisms and solutions. Right. Uh, uh, if I may, I, I have something that I, I wanted to share earlier that could really uh, provide an answer to uh, this group of questions on finance. And that could really be, and, and simply put, revolutionary if it happens. And I mentioned that very briefly, which is basically having a state-based um, SDG climate sustainability budgets for the state. Because so far, budgets of the state, national budgets, subnational budgets, are not aligned with the SDGs and with the climate action. The talk about love and affection of climate and the planet is in some place, and the budget of the state is not really meeting these kind of expectations. The starting point, perhaps, is at least to have, well, there are three steps, have a shadow budget for climate and the sustainable development goals. The second part, make it SDG aligned budget. The, th the third evolution could be an SDG based budget, which is basically because SDGs, as you know, contains climate action as SDG 13. That could really be a revolution. And that could really solve many of the issues that you mentioned about the needs for uh, external finance, including uh, the uh, 100 billion. Uh, that, that will be really with signals through integrated national financial framework through which you can get your SDG budget. And then you can send signals to the outside community about your needs. You need the private sector to partner with you. The budget of the state is the best way to communicate whether you are clouding in or God forbid clouding out. So this is a good starting point. And then super briefly, why the 100 billion is, is, are not delivered is ex exactly why the, the, the famous 0.7% of GNI for many decades have never been fulfilled. In a good moment, politicians under some pressure or perhaps for them to impress the media to say, well, I'm committing, I'm going to do, I'm going to do that. Nobody is pushing them to do it. But basically, they take a kind of an opportunistic approach or a political appealing message that we are helping the poor through the GNI um, of our country donating 0.7%. Or saying, well, we are going to be donating 100 billion. That could really be of significant size back there in 2009, and actually it was presented as a minimum, a critical minimum, but we haven't seen this minimum. So I think, and lack of accountability, because this is a kind, you are offering something that I, that I cannot really go and blame you if you don't, because I don't have between you and me any kind of accountability mechanism. But if it is in the budget of those who are donating, the concerned public of the donor countries would say, well, we committed and you are not delivering. And because of that, we are going to be pushing ourselves all in some serious trouble for our plan that's going to be affecting us all because of the negative externalities of the whole matter. This is basically a kind of a simple mechanism of addressing this complicated question on finance. 
Uh, Dr. Karyuk, maybe we go to you in terms of uh, channeling some of this through uh, the MDBs or uh, uh, an institution like the AFDB. Is that uh, is that a solution to make sure that uh, this money is uh, properly well tracked, monitored, and uh, and dispersed? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Omar. Um, no, as I mentioned in, in one of the interventions I made earlier, uh, I, I did mention that the paucity, in particular in Africa of climate finance is very, very clear. And therefore, we have undertaken various options or various approaches to try and, 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 and channel those climate through finance through, through the bank. Uh, for example, I, I talked about an initiative that the bank has is actually under, undertaking right now, which is to try and uh, raise about $13 billion dedicated specifically for climate finance in Africa. Yes, so therefore, in my view, uh, MDBs is one possible channel through which climate finance uh, could, be, uh, uh, could be accessed, uh, to, uh, to provision of climate finance could be provided to Africa. And indeed, already it is because uh, 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 if you look at entities such as uh, uh, the, the, the Green Climate Finance, the, 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 the Africa Development Bank is an, is, an, uh, is an accredited entity. And, and by saying this, what I wanted to also highlight is the complex nature of, of, of our architecture of climate finance, which lends it very difficult for countries that have limited capacity to be able to access that climate finance. Yes, there may be uh, reasonable uh, so, uh, uh, sources of uh, sort of amount of finance available in some of these climate funds, but I can say without fear of contribution because I will go through this all the time, the process of accessing that climate finance is, is, is very, very complicated. And, you know, and, and very bureaucratic. So as a result, you know, what we are hoping to do through that particular uh, climate action work I spoke about is to try and have a dedicated amount of capacity building um, uh, within our regional member countries in order to be able uh, to, to, to develop uh, uh, sort of um, enabling environments. For example, you know, what, what Dr. Mahmoud uh, sort of uh, alluded to, whereby you find there's a, a, a disconnect as to where the issue of private finance is addressed in a country. Is it in Ministry of Environment, or is it in Ministry of Finance, or they should be working together? That, those are some of the complications that we have that need to be addressed you know, sooner rather than later, if people are to put it that way. I think that is what I would want to say. But regarding the $100 billion, I think all I can say, I can support what Dr. Mahmoud said, I think is a question of prioritization. We all know that before COVID came up, uh, along, climate change was afflicting our continents, and in particular in, our, in Africa, in a big way. However, it never got the prioritization that COVID did. Despite the fact that the impacts of, uh, of climate change are going to be with us for a long period of time. Ukraine happened, and we saw the reaction. So I think, uh, and, and all along as we speak, uh, I, I don't believe that climate change went on sabbatical. It's climate change is still here. So I think it's a question of enhancing the voice and ensuring that climate change gets due prioritization in the global, uh, in the, in the global economy. And people are really happy. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, yeah, Ibrahim, I think you've got some ideas in terms of uh, on the financing side as well. Right. Well, first of all, I think uh, the message has been made loud and clear by our two speakers is that we can tackle resilience, adaptation, and mitigation at the same time. And I think Dr. Mahmoud made it very clear. The holistic approach indicates all of us need to learn how to multitask as opposed to addressing one in particular. Let me focus on the resilience side. That's where ARC comes in. I think it has been made clear in COP26 and uh, hopefully in COP27 as well. Loss and damages is such uh, is very important for Africa. So that is our way of protecting the vulnerable communities who are affected by drought, by tropical cyclone, and uh, by flood in some cases. So I think going back to your question about how do you channel the money, 
in my view, there are four ways of doing that, where ARC obviously is already doing it, but we can do more. Number one, uh, Dr. Mahmoud talked about the importance of having access to technology so that we can uh, build the African capacity and early warning systems because governing and, man and management is actually anticipated. If you look at the case of South Africa, when they went through a flood, it was a big question whether or not if the government has listened to the early warning system, maybe we could have saved some lives. So I think part of the money certainly could go to making sure we build the capacity of African countries along with the African Development Bank in uh, equipping African government in the early warning system, modeling of the risk so they at least understand the level of exposure. And that's something that ARC does. I think number two, if the, the government actually decide to transfer the risk to the insurance market, to mobilize additional resources so that the early response of government to those who are affected by climate issues came from an insurance market. Again, that's where ARC intervened. The challenge there is what we call the triple A, the affordability, the accessibility, and the availability of premium financing. So government can actually go and transfer the risk to the insurance market. Just to give you an indication, since our inception up to today, we've protected 90 million people in Africa. If we can get additional resources of premium financing, we can get up to a billion people in Africa protected because of risk transfer and so on. So I think there, part of the money can certainly be utilized to support the African government to afford the, the premium so that eventually they can decide to transfer this if they want to. I think third, equally important, not all the solution acting will come from insurance market alone. In some countries, the combination of uh, contingency funding, solidarity funding as well, may just be what some African countries may require people to at least beef up the capability to respond to climate uh, disasters as well. But I think last but not least, just to begin to recognize, as uh, uh, Dr. Mahmoud said earlier, this is a holistic problem. It has to be addressed holistically. In other words, some of this problem you have and drought happen the same way in the Southern region, in the ECOWAS region. There's so much to be done so we can actually cross-fertilize the expertise from region to region so we can love one another and not always expect the rest of the world to come to our rescue. So over to you, Omar. Yeah, so as a quick follow-up question to what you said, someone said, so given the work that ARC is doing, why haven't all the African countries signed up to, uh, to ARC? Well, first of all, all African countries that AU members are eligible to join ARC. So as of today, we have 35 member states. We want to do more to cover the whole continent. So let's hope that we can go beyond just 35 and get all the African countries actually to be members. But as of today, 35 is not that bad compared to the 55 we have of the continent, but we will not rest until we cover the whole continent. Dr. Kariuki, the elephant in the room to some extent on the, is the energy question. And obviously what we've seen recently in terms of uh, fossil fuels, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but uh, so the question, I'll, uh, I'll read it out if you, don't, if you don't mind. It's quite long, but I'll read it out. Phasing out existing production technologies that have driven growth in advanced economies to the present stage and replacing them with environmentally sustainable alternatives requires time and substantial capital outlay. Won't comply with the global won't compliance with the global timelines arrest Africa's current development trajectory, and how far will available funding provisions for the pursuit of the clean transformation cope with Africa's economic needs without plunging the continent into a deeper debt crisis? So basically, this is about the just transition that we're talking about, and ultimately the uh, the cost benefits, I suppose, in the short term. We know the long term benefits, but uh, there's uh, short term costs and a uh, current debt crisis that the continent also has to contend with. Uh, thank you very much, Omar. I think the 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 the, the, the starting point uh, is that uh, the Paris Agreement anticipates uh, two windows by which countries will get to net zero. Uh, the, for the developed countries, this is up to uh, 2050, is, uh, is in 2050. But for the less polluting countries, most of the, where the, most of the developing countries fall, this is by 2100. So in other words, there is still an opportunity for us to, um, to, to utilize the, the resources that we have and in an optimal manner 
uh, and, and ensure that uh, we are able to develop our economies, uh, you know, commensurate with our aspirations as a continent. So the, the issue here at the end of the day is a question of fossil fuel uh, source of generation, renewable source of generation, and you know, and how to be able to optimize those resources. I think what I can say uh, is that, first of all, the African Development Bank is very clear that we will not be able to do coal. It is true that coal has been able to, uh, has underpinned economic development to some of the leading countries in the world, including the, uh, in South Africa. However, that, 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 that boat of, you know, it's, it's also recognized that it, it, it contributes up to 40% of the global um, uh, uh, global emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. So it, I think it makes eminent sense to, 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 to stop uh, coal power generation. However, one has to, to, to realize that if you take the case of South Africa, you are unlikely to be able to convert uh, uh, all the coal fired power plants and, uh, and replace them with renewable energies while being able to safeguard the security of supplier. So this is a very important concept. Whatever we do, whatever transitions we, we, we may wish to adopt, we must be able to guarantee security of supplier. And unfortunately to date, despite uh, the enormous uh, potential we have on solar and wind, these are intermittent sources of generation and therefore cannot be able to provide your base load. So in the interim, we are very clear as a bank, as the African World Bank, that gas has a role to play as a transition source of, uh, as a, as a transition source of energy. And, and if you look at other countries, look at uh, uh, the US, look at the UK, look at Germany, they have been able to reduce their emissions over a period of time, purely by converting a lot of their coal plants into gas plants. I mean, empirically, what you have is that if you convert a coal plant into a gas uh, power plant, you are able to reduce emissions by 40% straight, straight away. So what, what, I, what I anticipate is that you know, we have an opportunity to transit from heavy coal reliance to gas, but if you do gas, you also have to be uh, to be alive to the fact that there are emerging technologies such as uh, green hydrogen. And therefore, if you want to avoid a situation whereby you can be uh, you can have what we call stranded assets, it is imperative that any any gas technology that you bring on board must be adaptable or amenable to uh, to, to, to to switching from gas. To, to, be, uh, to green hydrogen. So that way, in the fullness of time, you'll have a situation whereby you are transiting from coal to gas and to green hydrogen, while also on, this, on the other hand, you are actually bringing uh, on board resources of renewable energies, which I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, extreme, you know, we have uh, abundant sources of renewable energy. For example, you know, I did mention that Africa has 40% of the global potential or, um, in, solar, in, in solar energy. But what I did not say is that of that 40% 40, 40 of global potential, only 1% has been harnessed to date. So there's incredible amount of potential or of growth whereby we can be able to increase renewables in our system. So I think at the end of the day, what I can say, it is a question of optimizing our resources and to the extent that we can be able to interconnect our grids, the Southern African power pool, the East African power pool, the West African power pool, that way we can be able to be to share the, the, the energy, the, the renewable energy sources that are found in different parts of the continent. Let me stop there, Omar, thank you. And uh, so one last question for you, and then I'll go to Dr. Rahaldin, and then we'll probably wrap it up, Ibrahima. Uh, with your final question. But uh, so Hubert Danzo from the African Green Infrastructure Investment Bank asks, how can we in the investment community get access to the information on the projects that you mentioned so that we can access and co-invest and support them? 
So how can they work with the bank in terms of these projects? No, um, you know, when it comes to, to projects, you know, you know, the, the, you know, the projects that we, that we attend to, we respond to regional member countries. And once we have this, this uh, uh, projects, we have a portal, uh, the Africa Energy Portal, if, if uh, Africa Energy Portal, where, where anybody can see any of the projects that are coming up. So we try to put a lot of these projects that are brought to our attention in, in some of those portals. But also countries, you know, at the end of the day, we are responsive to our clients. So we don't own these projects. So the countries will generate the projects and we will analyze those projects and participate in those particular projects. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, the, you know, we, we are also very transparent. I think uh, recently we were we were not fast in globally in terms of transparency as far as some of our development outcomes are concerned and the projects we are involved in. Therefore, you know, if you look at our website, you will always find any new initiatives that we are uh, attending to, and I'm sure countries will also try to uh, broadcast or, or, or publicize other initiatives in their countries. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Bahadine, this is this comes to COP27 and ultimately the negotiations from an African perspective. So we've got the uh, Africa group of uh, negotiators. We also got we heard from the African Development Bank that they'll be uh, hosting the African Pavilion. We have also got Egypt ultimately, who's going to be coordinating and uh, chairing the discussions and making sure that uh, different interests are uh, are met. So who who is going to be representing the African voice ultimately and making sure that uh, African voice is heard? Right, I'm, um, I'm speaking here on my capacity again as a champion. And as you know, as champions, we deal with the non-state actors, negotiators, they have their own uh, track. They are the main uh, party of the discussions and the negotiations. And our mandate as champions, we provide catalytic um, uh, role to support whatever the, uh, the negotiators um, uh, uh, agree on. Having said that, as, um, as a close observer, um, I think there is um, a very articulated African voice today through the negotiators um, uh, network. Um, they they um, um, uh, do great work as well in uh, coordination with the African Union. Uh, individual countries, um, I mean, having a group of countries agreeing on a matter doesn't uh, at all undermine the importance of negotiation from a sovereign and national perspective. At the end of the day, the NDCs are nationally determined contributions. So, um, and I'm happy to tell you that the extent of sophistication that the African negotiators have achieved, either through years of experience, through selection of the best to represent the countries, learning from each others, getting adequate assistance when needed, are very much comforting. What is my, of my great concern um, is basically about what the, the negotiators achieve and the, um, uh, and the difference between what is being agreed upon and what's being uh, implemented, which still leaves a lot to be desired in the forefronts. In mitigation, which is actually progressing better than adaptation, in adaptation, which is recognized better than the loss and damage. And where it comes to finance, we're still in that conundrum. That, but definitely this, this time, I think between the three of us and the good questions, I think we provided not just a kind of an assessment of what is going wrong, but how to fix it. It's all about getting this kind of political determination timeline, accountability to get what we are discussing on track. Perfect. Look, we're running out of time. So, uh, Ibrahima, maybe I'll give you the floor. I know you, you wanted to uh, ask a right. uh, last question to your uh, to your speakers and guests today. Well, all right, Omar. Thank you very much. And obviously, a thank you is in order to our audience for those great questions brought about by Omar. And this is exactly what we wanted to have from as a reaction. Uh, gentlemen, we talked uh, about four different topics. Uh, the state of climate change on the continent, COP26 in Africa, as we march COP27 and beyond. So if you were to give us in few seconds, 
Uh, what do you think should be the key messages to take away from this conversation as we prepare for COP27? Starting with you, Dr. Mahmoud. Well, in a few seconds, the COP27 adopting a holistic approach, focusing on implementation, supported by finance and technical assistance. And by finance, we mean all sources, domestic, external, public, and private, with a focus on the regional dimension as well when it comes to implementation. And we cannot really, in that holistic approach with addict finance, ignore what could be done within boundaries of states in coordination with the regions through localization of the solutions. And it's a very compact and bloody, any messages there to convey to COP27. Go ahead, Dr. Karioki, what would be your takeaway message? You're on mute, Dr. Dr. Sorry, 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 I beg your pardon. That's, uh, you know, I would echo what um, uh, Dr. Mahmoud has said, but also add that uh, it is imperative um, that that Africa projects a unified a unified voice on climate change, and this such a unified voice will entail common appreciation of climate change and its impacts and ways of mitigating as well adapting to climate uh, to climate change. Also, in my view, um, I, I think um, uh, it, it, it will be important that, uh, you know, what we said earlier, that, uh, you know, we, we need to, uh, if we have that unified voice, that voice must champion for developing countries to translate their commitments, okay? Their party agreement commitments and the new pledges which they made at Glasgow into tangible actions. And, 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 and here I don't need to, to, to mention this, we we'll talked about quite, quite a bit, but here what I'm talking about, the US $100 billion per year, this is still very important, although they say that, that the plan is to make, reach it by 2025. And of course, what for me is very, very important also is the promise uh, for doubling adaptation finance uh, relative to 2019 by 2025. But also, I think we have to find ways, creative ways, of involving the private sector in mobilizing climate finance. We've talked about MDBs and other sources of um, sort of uh, more, more official sources of finance, but I think it's important that we are able to tap into the private sector to be able uh, to, to, to mobilize, uh, sort of to, to facilitate or to provide access to private finance. Excellent. Well, so many great messages, and I have no doubt that the team has Put together, but just basically, uh, COP27 has to be approached in a holistic manner so we can actually multitask with resilience, adaptation, and mitigation. Second, we need to actually favor implementation so we can move from talk to actual action and tangible result. And then, third, we need to actually make sure we can get a broad pool of financing options so we can actually meet the needs of the African countries. We also talked about the importance of favoring regional coordination so that we can work across the African countries. Africa should have a united voice so we can speak in, uh, with one voice in, uh, at COP27 and also use that one voice to make sure the commitment has been made uh, actually fully uh, respected by the developed world. And last but not least, as we favor adaptation finance, we need also need to promote and foster private sector investments and financing for adaptation and climate change in the African continent. So, so many great ideas, and I have no doubt those ideas will keep them accountable to COP27 so that when we have our next lecture, we can see how much progress we have made. As they say in Senegal, unfortunately, every good thing must come to an end. So this conversation has come, unfortunately, to an end, but by no means, the conversation about the African voice to, to World COP27 is not going to end today. It will continue to various platforms. And I'm pleased that Dr. Mahmoud is going to a couple of platform and event where the conversation will continue across the world and across in different uh, uh, platform. Let me use this opportunity, obviously, to thank 
the ARC and the IC publication team that made this actually possible. I know they've been working on this for quite some time to make it possible. And Dr. Mahmoud and Dr. Karioke, we are grateful for your presence. I know how busy you are, and it was very difficult to secure your confirmation, but in the end, we deliver thanks to my good sister also, Dr. Abla, we made it very clear. Yeah. It's important we have uh, Dr. Mahmoud on this call, as well, uh, Dr. Karioke. It's an honor. Like you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Use this opportunity also to thank the African Union. They play a major role for this event, not only to Commissioner Absolutely. Saho, but also they lend their voice, their platform to make sure that the African voice is heard and the African Development Bank, as well as the Institute, the Egyptian Institute uh, for Economic Studies that Dr. Abla is ably leading. So until then, thank you very much. We'll see you at the next lecture series and thank you for taking some time. She's this incredible woman with us. We look forward to the next lecture series. At COP27, we'll have a side event and a lecture series. So, Omar, that's the end of it. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. And see you all.